Hello, and welcome to this podcast. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Jesper Lund. Jesper is chairman of IT Poll, a Danish digital rights organization that works to promote privacy and freedom in the information society. IT Poll is one of the 44 members of EDRI, the European digital rights organization. Jesper has been a key contributor since 2014 to EDRI's ongoing work on net neutrality. He is also a member of the Danish Net Neutrality Forum, hosted by the Telecommunications Industry Association. Besides net neutrality, his work on digital rights currently focuses on data protection applied to EU law enforcement. Okay, Jesper, you know about our 3 plus 1 format. You get three questions and one soapbox moment. So let's start with question one. How do you interpret the relationship between users accessing more content and services online and the impact this may have on telecom operators? Well, first of all, I don't really see this as a new development. Uh, traffic volumes have always increased every year. There's, there's really nothing new here. So end users buy internet subscriptions and use them to access whatever content they want. That is by design. <laughs> Now it's secured through the uh, EU net neutrality regulation from 2015, which says that ISPs or telcos cannot interfere with the choice of services by, by end users. Mm -hmm. um, we use more and more online services in part because online plays a greater and greater role in our lives. And this is really a business opportunity for, for telcos um, because on these online services create demands for faster internet access services. Everybody needs an internet access service these days. If we only use the internet for email or filing tax returns, we would go for a cheap mobile subscription with a low prepaid data volume. That would suffice. But we don't. We want Netflix. We want high definition video streaming. We want social media, video conferencing, uh, perhaps one day the, uh, the metaverse. And all of that creates end user demand for high speed internet access services. And this is the market actually works. Uh, in Denmark, my, my own country, fiber based networks are now outnumber cable TV networks mm -hmm. for high speed internet access. Even those about investing in a new infrastructure rather than using the existing one for, for, for cable TV. Then we have 5G, uh, but well, people will not pay for 5G because it's a new technology. They will pay for 5G in the form of premium subscriptions because it can deliver greater data volumes and higher speeds. Mm. End users will do that when they actually need it. So one misunderstanding that is often heard in this debate is that online services or content and application providers, CAPS as they're called, send large volumes of traffic into the networks of telcos. But this is a misunderstanding. The traffic is always sent at the explicit request of the end user who has, who has already paid for the internet access. Paying here doesn't necessarily mean flat rates. Um, there are certainly internet connections, especially on mobile networks with capacity constraints, which come with data caps. But it's still the end user who decides how to use the internet connection within these limits. Um, as I said, traffic volumes are increasing. Um, this doesn't mean that the costs are going up for telcos because techn there are technological advances, uh, which means that new equipment can handle greater volumes or bandwidth of traffic for the same or even lower prices. Um, one thing that has changed, though, is that traffic has become more concentrated with a few online services and content delivery networks, the so-called CDNs. And, Recently, especially Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, Fang, have been singled out. Um, this reflects the, uh, the choice of end users for various reasons. But from the viewpoint of network optimization, I would say it actually helps the telcos providing internet access to end users in a more efficient and potentially cheaper way. And the reason for that is that the large... Um, uh, content and application providers have built their own content delivery networks mm -hmm. that deliver the traffic very close to the local access network of the ISP. Increasingly, these CDNs are even placed within the network of the ISP, the so-called on-net CDNs. Mm -hmm. So this mutual arrangement really benefits everybody, and in particular, it saves costs for the ISP compared to 
end users accessing other services where the ISP would have to pay for, say, a transit provider to move the traffic onto the internet. And that this is especially relevant for smaller ISPs, which do not have their um, transit business uh, and have to rely on, on other uh, providers for, for, for that purpose. Okay, so that that's, I mean, the, the, the fact that um, content is demanded by users, not supplied by content providers, I think is is uh, something that instinctively everyone understands. But I, what I liked in your answer also is the fact that what is qualified as a big tech um, and and uh, complained about as gatekeepers and centralized, etc., actually has an infrastructure benefit because that means also that the traffic is centralized in certain places and easier uh, maybe to pick up or more efficient to pick up uh, by telcos. Um, looking at, at that conversation about big tech and the relationship with uh, telcos, let's, let's look at the second question. What are the inherent dangers, if any, of big tech being requested to pay for the network of telcos? Well, the, the payment structure for providing internet access has always been based on the principle that everybody, whether it's end users that consume content or online services which provide content, pay for their own uh, access to the internet. Um, the purpose of the internet is then to connect uh, these networks so that everybody can access every uh, service, and this is called interconnection. So as the main rule, there's no charge for sending traffic into other networks, uh, the so-called bill and keep principle. This is very different from telephone networks where you always have termination fees, um, which are paid for sending traffic, meaning calls into the network of other telcos. And if we look at international telephone calls, that is great for illustrating the difference for, for end users. They are still paid by the minute and at relatively high rates, mm -hmm. which even though they have come down, used to be several euros per minute historically. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you can use services such as Signal, WhatsApp, and Skype, which are not charging by the minute. And the reason for that is that these services use the internet where access to the internet has already been paid for by the end user and by the companies providing these mm -hmm. services. So in this case, the absence of network termination fees create more free choice of services for end users. And this is generally the case. Now, internet access is not completely free of the termination mon monopoly. Um, so the providers have, by, almost by definition, a termination monopoly for mm -hmm. their own end users. Um, and it is true that sometimes there is an additional payment from online services for the so-called uh, peering in, in the interconnection agreements. Um, but this is the exception to the rule. In, on, in most cases, the interconnection agreements are settlement free. Um, one important point is that there are limits to how much um, internet service providers can charge for paid peering because internet traffic can be routed through different networks. That is a very important feature um, of the internet. So the proposal we have from, from European uh, telcos is basically an attempt to introduce the telephone model um, into the internet as a way of, of pricing the use of, uh, of, of the internet. Um, it is called sending party, sending party network pays in the context of the internet. But it basically means the same thing, create artificially high termination fees. And they are demanding regulation for this because they cannot get it uh, through commercial agreements uh, mm -hmm. for the reasons that I mentioned. Internet traffic can be routed through different networks. This was actually suggested by, by Edno uh, 10 years ago uh, and rejected uh, by, um, by the regulators in Berwick. Um, and nothing has changed in the meantime. So one argument put forward um, in favor of these payments is to support investments. Um, but there's no evidence that charging high termination fees leads to higher investment. Um, actually, studies of the uh, telephone market show the contrary, um, that sort of exploiting the, the monopoly position does not generate uh, higher investments. And the consequences of this proposal for the internet ecosystem, um, besides the telcos themselves, will be strongly negative. Everybody is going to lose besides the telcos. 
sending party network pays will interfere with the principle of net neutrality because online services uh, that are forced to pay special fees for their internet access are also meant to be end users whose traffic cannot be discriminated against. Um, um, and at the very least, um, these additional charges for a service like Netflix uh, will have to be passed on to consumers mm -hmm. at the end. So we will get more expensive uh, video streaming and essentially, we, we will be paying twice. First, we'll be paying for access to the internet, which can be used for Netflix or anything else. And then we will indirectly have to pay the network costs that are pushed onto Netflix. Um, there could be other unexpected consequences. Um, the content delivery networks um, that large online services have built um, are used for their own traffic and sometimes traffic of their customers in their cloud services. Yeah. For video streaming, that could include the public broadcasters in Europe, which would face higher costs because of this. Um, and EU regulation to secure payments from big tech through um, interconnect interconnection agreements could interfere with the routing arrangements um, so that what is optimal uh, in all cases is not what, what is actually used. And it would certainly interfere with the incentives of ISPs and large online services to work together and deliver optimal routing outcomes, which is really to the benefit of everybody, ISPs, online services, whether big tech or not, and end users. And one concrete example of that would be looking at South Korea, where the sending party network uh, pay, uh, payment model has been introduced with rather disastrous consequences. Um, Worse service for end users mm. uh, because uh, Facebook moves its its online uh, caching outside South Korea, so there's lower access to Facebook, um, and similar negative consequences, which basically results from no longer using the optimal um, optimal arrangements for uh, delivering internet traffic. Thank you, Jesper. Um, so basically there are precedents of trying to implement or implementing uh, center party network pays. One is vintage telephony, one is current South Korea, and in both cases, no benefits uh, have emerged, but actually um, negative consequences for users and for providers uh, can, can be seen. Uh, I certainly remember my international calls invoices uh, when I was much younger and pre-Skype and, and WhatsApp. Um, and also in terms of, of dangers or at least um, uh, non-fulfilled promises, um, I take your point that there is no evidence that more investment would come out of such an arrangement. Um, switching to the third question, and I know that's a more controversial one. Uh, do you think it is appropriate to compare the contribution of big tech and telcos in infrastructure as suggested by some? Well, we have certainly seen lots of comparisons recently. Uh, European telcos and big tech have, have commissioned studies that, that highlight their investment. And I will say I have read some of these studies and first, first and foremost, they reflect the structure of the internet ecosystem where everybody pays for their own internet access. So telcos have the task of building an access network that allows their end users, consumers, and businesses to access the internet. So the investment for that task is highlighted in reports put out by telcos, whether we talk about uh, cable-based uh, networks, fixed networks, or mobile access. Our big tech or sort of online content providers more generally or providers of content delivery networks um, have the task of building data centers with servers that can deliver the content requested by end users. And in between these access, the, the access networks uh, of the telcos and the data centers, we have interconnection, which used to be dominated by background providers of internet transit. These background providers have increasingly been taken over by the, uh, the content delivery networks themselves um, of the large online services. Uh, because they exchange traffic directly with the ISPs, often delivering the traffic to the doorstep of the ISP, the so-called on-net CDNs. So all of this 
requires investment at different levels, and that is reflected in the various reports showing the, the current division of labor in the internet ecosystem. Telcos have their access networks, um, which is a different task than online services, whether they are big and small. And yes, we can certainly comparing the investments in billions of euros if we want to. But the question is, does this provide anything meaningful? Um, I don't think so. So before looking at any numbers, I would expect that it is more expensive to build an access network that can reach all the end users in the European Union compared to having centralized data centers that can serve all of these end users. Um, and that may very that probably means larger capital expenditure for telcos and their access networks compared to data centers um, of big tech and other online services. But that is also reflected in the pricing of the respective services. Mm -hmm. So take social media services as an example, where sort of users provide the content. You don't have to pay movie, movie producers like, like Netflix has to. Um, these services can be financed solely through advertising in a quite profitable way, actually. This is not possible with internet access for end users where a monetary payment is always involved. Hmm. We could also make comparisons of profits, and I, I know this has been done, um, but that would also not really provide anything meaningful in, in terms of uh, information that is relevant for public policy purposes. Um, telcos, on one hand, represent a mature industry with a stable demand. There will always be end users that need internet access and are willing to pay for it. They have to. So mm -hmm. the homogeneous nature of this uh, industry supports competition and that limits above normal profits. But there's no reason why telcos, the telco industry, cannot produce fair profit margins for, it inv for its investors. End users, if they demand internet access services, will have to pay for it. So this industry structure is, is, is very different from that of online services. Here, the investment risks are much higher. And when looking at profits and comparing profits, we tend to focus on the current winners among the online services. And they may not exist in 10 or 15 years. So think of MySpace that was very popular 15 years ago, and nobody uh, knows MySpace today, um, unless they are very old. Um, so this is not to say that there are no market abuses by big tech that drive the high profits. That is certainly the case, I think, but these pro problems have absolutely nothing to do with the difference between telcos and big tech, whether we look at capital expenditure or profit margins. Thank you, Jesper, for making me feel old about my space. <laughs> I still remember it. I, I, I even remember Netscape and Alta Vista. <laughs> um, but but I, I, I see your point that to a certain extent, when talking about these investments, they are complementary, but they it's like comparing apples and oranges, basically. Uh, those are different businesses. They're in different parts of the value chain. And obviously, the numbers reflect that. Um, and now we come to the, the famous soapbox moment, uh, where you have one to two minutes to deliver a message to uh, what I call the powers that be in the EU, which are represented by two strong women, uh, Ursula von der Leyen from the European Commission and Roberta Metzola from the European Parliament. You can say anything and uh, I'm sure they will be listening <laughs> or at least someone <laughs> from the European Commission and the European Parliament will be listening. First and foremost, uh, I really hope that any regulatory intervention in network interconnection, which is what we're talking about, should be evidence-based. There's currently a lot of lobbying by EU telcos on one hand and US big tech on the other. So we need independent studies from BEREC, uh, the um, European telecom regulators and others to answer questions like, are there, current fa are there failures in the current interconnection agreements that need a public policy response? Uh, is there problems to address? And what are the best ways of supporting investment in infrastructure for the internet's ecosystem compared to the current model where end users are supposed to pay for it. Big tech is currently very unpopular in the European Union, and that is for good reasons. There are many abuses of big tech that needs to be addressed by policymakers and regulators. Hopefully the DMA, the DSA, along with the GDPR can do that. However, forcing unilateral payments from big tech to large EU telcos will not address the problems with big tech. 
it could actually even make the problems worse by making the telcos dependent on continued large traffic volumes from big tech, which is really creating the wrong incentives from a public policy point of view. Thank you, Jesper. Um, I think that is probably the concluding sentence is we do not want to create the wrong incentives uh, in the internet ecosystem that is I mean, 80% of the internet ecosystem is a big success and has been a big su success. Obviously, it has flows and growing pains and the DMA, the DSA and the GDPR uh, have been adopted to try and address some of those. But yes, um, incentives are very important in this space. And I do hope that um, the EU institutions will listen to your advice about evidence-based policymaking. And uh, should a consultation uh, be issued, as we hope, uh, I'm sure that this con conversation will continue uh, on this topic. Thank you, Jesper. Thank you.